working with Seth area. I've been working with Seth for six, seven years now. It was almost eight years. I started with version 0.19, which is pretty old. Um, and ever since, I've been helping all kinds of companies from small to large, helping them with the deploying Seth and finding out a lot of things which people break, and I'm here to tell you things you should not do with your system. Um, so, we have a company, we provide uh, consultancy and training for Seth, um, and uh, yeah, we're an independent company. And so, um, breaking your Seth system. Well, Seth is a very good system. It's pretty hard to break it, but if you've not been starting to do stupid things, you will break it or lose data. Um, the examples which I'm giving here are real life examples of which happen. I'm not trying to discredit somebody or say he was stupid doing it, but I'm just trying to learn you something so you don't make the same mistakes and break your own system. Um, there's no order in these. I just picked 10 of the same things I saw, which were yeah, sad or funny cases, the way you want to look at it, uh, which you should not do. So uh, let's get started. I've got like 30 minutes, I think. So uh, have I 30 minutes, I think? Okay, good. So, Roman Crush Failure Domain. It's, it's very cool to see, uh, to see your system running. Uh, you deployed it over different racks, and uh, it's up and running, up and running, and suddenly I got a call on Sunday morning saying, the system is down, can you help me? I'm like, down, what do you mean? Yeah, we have a power failure in the rack. And I'm like, okay. So I, I logged in, and it turned out that they had their racks mapped in their crush map and such, Hosts were in the right location, but looking at the crash map, there was a mistake in the crash map. It was a one-liner. So if you see the line saying choose the first end host, although they had the racks in there with the servers in there, crash was balancing over different hosts instead of over racks. Um, well, eventually it took like two to three hours to get the power back in the rack and get it all up and running again, but they never tested it. So they just assumed because they had the racks in the, the crash map, it was okay, it was running. Well, it was running until a rack went down. There was like eight machines in a rack. So uh, no data was lost in this case, but it caused some, some serious downtime. And afterwards, we had to migrate roughly 500 terabytes of data to be backfilled in that system, which took quite some time to go from host to rack. So um, do these tests with your system before you deploy, instead of assuming it will be okay and it runs just fine. And yes, these things do happen. So test them, test them, keep testing them, and uh, know the worst line. Decommissioning a host. Well, Seth has all kinds of cool tools, and it does recovery when a host goes down. But the best way to decommission a system is to mark the host needs as out. And the admin in this case, well, he thought he knew Seth well, so he turned off the machine. And after a few minutes, the backfilling started, and it was working fine. But at that a few hours later, during the backfill, a second disk failed. And this system was running with two replicas. And I'll get back to two replicas later because I've got a lot of examples with this. But another disk failed, and then he lost data. Um, roughly 170 terabytes of data on the CephFS file system was just broken, corrupted. We had to abandon the system and wipe it and try again. So um, this could only even happen with three replicas. If you decommission a system, do not turn off the system, mark the OSDs as out, wait for the data to move away from the system, and then remove it from your cluster. Don't just shut it down and have recovery kick in. Although it seems to work fine, you're running in a degraded state and you're just uh, endangering your data. So please do not do it. Just mark it out of, uh, out of step. Removing log files from the most data directory. Um, if you're deploying a Luminous system right now, you won't see these SSD files anymore because Luminous is using RocksDB, but we still have a lot of systems running out there with Firefly, Hammer, and Jewel. And the partition was filling up uh, on the system because it was doing a backfill. Um, and the monitors, the database, keep growing because they keep a, keep a history of all the OSD maps, and it kept growing and growing and growing. And the admin in this case, and then you gave me an example of how but this stuff happens in the real world. Um, he did a quick Google on SSD files, and it said log files. So he assumed there were logs of the monitors instead of being actual database log files. So he started removing those files from the monitors, <coughs> and actually garbage the monitors, which would then make, well, the whole system was lost. Although you can rebuild the monitor database using the OSDs, it's quite a difficult and painful task. Um, and eventually the system was abandoned. 
What I'd like to stress here is that if your system is going to be in a backfill for a very long time, the monitor database will keep growing. It got better with Luminous, and there are patches out there to make it even better. But to keep it short, the monitors keep a history, keep a longer history of the system. Um, just a few days ago, I have a system which is doing a backfill going from file store to blue store. It has been backfilling for eight days now. The monitor database has grew from two gigabytes to 45 gigabytes. So planning your system makes sure there's enough space available in your monitors. And as your system grows, the monitor database will grow with them. So um, under normal circumstances, that will be pretty small. But plan ahead for having more AI in those monitor databases so that you can sustain a very long backfill, which might be happening when you're going to be migrating from file store to blue store. Uh, something to keep in mind, they might use that disk space. Um, so yeah, the system I was talking about, which is doing the backfill, we put in one terabyte SSD in there, which is, just works fine, gives us enough space. Removing the wrong tool. This is not what happens. Um, I couldn't help this person anymore because he just removed the pool. Um, with RBD, I saw there's a new feature where you can trash RBD and get them back from the trash bin. Well, with pools, there is no such way. If you clean a pool, it's gone and it's gone forever. So, um, yes, there's a flag. Yes, I really, really need it. Um, <laughs> but um, if you just type the wrong pool, the person in this case thought the pool was empty. It wasn't used. He didn't double check, didn't ask his colleagues. And in this case, it was just, just 12 terabytes. But you can imagine for somebody, 12 terabytes can be a lot of vital information. Um, so what I recommend is that you always set the no delete flag on a pool. There's a, a flag you can set on a pool, preventing it from being deleted. And previous to Luminous, there was a, there is a setting won't allow pool delete. It was set to true by default in, in Jewel, and it's now false in Luminous. So you have to go through a lot of hoops removing a pool, but just, just, be, just be cautious. If you're removing a pool, get a colleague, get somebody else also to look at it and say, do we want to remove this one? Yes. So if you get a cool GUI like Open Attic and you can remove a pool, just have a second person come in and check it. You could rename the pool, yes, but I think that um, you won't be impacted immediately because the PGs are prefixed by the ID of the pool, so any existing client will just be talking to the same PGs and you won't notice immediately. Um, it won't be clients which are starting up and then resolving it. So, um, rename might help, but I still recommend that you do a double check um, with, your, with your colleagues. And yes, this stuff happens, so be cautious. Well, setting a no-out flag for a long time. Uh, does everybody know what the no-out flag means? Or who doesn't know what the no-out flag means? Well, I see a few hands. Let me explain anyway. Um, if, if an OSD goes down um, after five, depending, or ten minutes, depending on the version of set you're running, an OSD will be marked as out. It means that data starts to migrate away from that OSD, or actually it's not participating in data placement anymore, so backfilling and recovery kicks in uh, to fix it. Um, but um, some people have issues with scrubbing. So what they do is that they set the no scrub and no use scrub flag, which turns the system into health warning. And if you set the no out flag, it goes to health warning as well. But these admins were used to having a system running in warning state. So nobody noticed that the no out flag was set. Um, then there's something called minimal size for set, which is the amount of replicas which need to be online for a placement group to serve I.O. Although they were running with three replicas, minimal size was set to one. So over time, one disk failed, backfilling never started. A second disk failed, backfilling never started. A third disk failed, and there you go. So don't get used to running a system in health warning. In addition, minimal size should be set to two uh, on any system, but uh, just don't get used to health warning. And I see a lot of systems out there which are just permanently in health warning, and people are just fine with it. And you might be laughing, but it happens. It happens. I see so many systems running in that way. So just go and do it and make sure minimal size is set to something larger than one. So usually two. Well, mounting XFS, if you're still using file store, or still using, if you're using file store, probably a lot of people are using file store. There's something called no barrier, and people who are seeing all these problems, 
they start googling and they see somebody saying on some random page saying that using a no barrier option gives you a performance improvement so people start applying the no barrier option well right barriers are something there to safeguard your data and the cluster in this case was it it happened was mounted with no barrier and there was a ground failure in the data center so there was not real power failure the power free state stayed up but the ground failed so in that case all power went out for all systems and the whole system just crashed well it came back but with all kinds of corrupted xfs file systems and we were never able to recover this system it was just way too broken um, so be cautious if you're using uh, file store it's not a default option but there are people running with no barrier behind their system. I've seen them on the user mailing list as well, using no barrier options, uh, just don't do it. Don't. Luckily with Blue Store, you're not able to do it. So, But a similar case is where people actually enable write-back caching on their controller without having a battery backup unit. They don't have an idea what the write-back caching does, but it's just a flag saying write-back cache, turn it on. Some controllers refuse to enable it without a battery backup unit, but others just, they do. And again, here we go with power failures. Power failures seem to happen as well in data centers. They do happen. Um, in this case, it was only one rack which went down, so no data was actually lost because we still had the replicas and other racks, and it was fine. But um, uh, be cautious. If you have write back enabled, also make sure, if you have a controller, that the battery is in a, a good state. It sometimes happens that the battery seems to die when the power goes out. So um, check them and replace them regularly or like every two or three years or something uh, if you're using them. So um, do not enable right back caching um, unless you have a battery behind there. Well, creating too many placement groups. Um, this morning somebody um, already said Luminous has a new feature called the PG Overdose. I think it was Dan who told it. But uh, PG Overdose prevents you from creating too many PGs, but in the earlier days of Ceph, and meaning those systems are still running, Hammer and Jewel, even Firefly systems are running out there. Um, I configured the system for a customer with around 8K placement groups, and um, they needed some additional pools to do some tests, so they simply copied my configuration, kept creating pools, and kept creating pools. Went fine, and then we got another power outage. They, they keep happening. Um, starting the OSDs again, they started to consume CPU and memory and just the snowball effect of the cluster going down, going down. And eventually we started adding CPUs and memory and um, all babysitting it for a week. We got the system up and running again. My warning here is be cautious with placement groups. I'm very happy that going towards Mimic we might have PG merging and do we John? Nah. And we have a manager module doing this stuff for us, but if you're still running something with um, a Hammer or Jewel, uh, or even with Luminous, uh, check the amount of PGs you have. They're not for free. And you will run into most of the time the PG issues if you have a serious issue. Um, when systems <coughs> need to be rebooted, or you have a power outage, or you have a network problem, then they start to repair the OSDs, and they can consume quite some CPU and memory at that point. And if you don't have the resources in the systems, it will just be a snowball effect where they just keep marking each other's down. And, um, it, it, it's getting better with Luminous, it's getting a lot better. Um, but if you have more system running, um, watch out. Well, using two times replication. Um, I can have loads of cases here, but I'm just saying one. Just do not use two x replication. Is there somebody here who is running with two? There's somebody being honest, okay. There's a two, three, yeah, okay. I see the hands. It's completely up to you if you want to use two times replication, but it is a real danger and stuff which happens. Um, a single disk failure could even um, um, lose data. The example is here you take a machine down for maintenance while you're doing maintenance on the machine, another disk fails. Although you think you still have the data because well, you, you can boot that machine, according to Seth, it's outdated data because you have writes going on that failed disk. So we'll keep asking you for bringing me, bring me the, old, the other disk back and see a placement group in the incomplete state. And if you look closer, it says, bring me the disk back. And you say, well, I don't have the disk anymore. Um, yeah, there are all kinds of things which you can do to re 
refer to places in the group and say, use the old version, ignore history, blah, 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 but eventually you will corrupt data. Um, and I get customers saying to me, yeah, otherwise my, my use case won't work for Seth because it becomes too expensive. <laughs> and I said, well, yeah, then uh, that's it. Then you should do something else. Um, data is valuable. Um, make sure you use three types of location and use a minimal sizing too, at least. Or use erasure coding with a, a good value as well. Um, I've just seen too many cases. Just don't use two types of location. Don't. That's been going pretty quick, so. Oh, underestimate, underestimate the monitors. I, I got it in there earlier with a lot of price, but I still see people running monitors, uh, co-locating them with other services because they're lightweight demons, putting them on a random machine, putting them in a VM, putting them anywhere because they think they're just losing a few hundred megabytes and I'll just run them in somewhere. Um, please use, use them or place them on dedicated hardware on a a uh, machine which has the resource to run the monitor, they're not heavy, correct? If you use a simple 4 core machine with 16 gigabytes of memory, it's okay. But I've seen people using USB sticks. They, they use a Dell server which has SD cards in there. They figure, well, it fits on there, it should run. Well, the SD card wears out pretty quickly. If you look at it technically, the monitors synchronize the database constantly with each other, all synchronized writes, you'll burn through the SD card pretty quickly. So use reliable hardware. Like I said, use a big SSD. Well, the bigger your system becomes, I always recommend using a bigger SSD just to make sure that the database of the monitor fits on there. Um, thinking if you can back up the monitor database, well, just don't because it's, it's outdated the moment you create the backup. So uh, there's no way to back up monitor databases. For some systems, I never recommend, instead of having three, go to five monitors and do, use different brands of hardware um, so that you have a, a risk, um, you're spreading the risk, um, so just use a data center grade SSD um, behind them. But they say all good things go to 11. And this is something which happened to me, well not happened to me, but I, I assisted. It was actually um, somebody, uh, before I came into the office, um, we needed to do some migration, he figured I'll update the key in, in Seth before he gets in. And the real staff admins might see the, the issue here with the key. Um, we were going to be adding a new pool to this system. And he updated the key without looking at the key uh, very well. And by accident, he removed the right bit from the volumes pool in the credentials. And although the new volumes SSD pool was added to the list, Seth suddenly started to say there's no permission to write on this system. And that causes some real issues with RBD and VMs. About 2,000 VMs went down that day, and there was a lot of phone calls coming in from customers saying why the VM was down. It wasn't not only the VM was down, but we had corrupted ext 4 journals, uh, XFS process with refusing to mount, uh, all kinds of stuff. I was doing non staff work the whole day with fixing VMs. Um, so be cautious when you're updating keys, and there's a bit of a delay in here as well when you update a key before it becomes visible to all clients. Um, so if your system goes down behind OpenStack or something, the I.O. simply block, and that's fine. The apps just wait. But in this case, the Rados and LibRVD start spinning errors to, to the PM on top, saying permission denied, permission denied, permission denied. So uh, be cautious with updating keys. Double check them, double test them before you reject them and update them, uh, because it might break your system. Um, I don't know if we lost data that day, I don't know for sure, but um, it was just a hell to getting 2,000 VMs up and running again by a single typo. <coughs> it was a single typo. So, those are the things I wanted to share with you. I got, well, I got more than enough time left. I think it was quick uh, this, uh, this time. Thanks for listening. Um, any questions? Well, I, I, I can hear you, you repeat know, the question. So you talked about the problem of having too many placement groups, but the number of placement groups to the scale the number of OSDs you have, right? So does that give you a practical upper limit on how big a cluster you can have? Just because more OSDs means you can have more placement groups. 
Yeah, so, but in this case, so yeah, the amount of placement you're asking, the amount of placement group scales with the amount of OSD. So the rule of thumb is, let's say, 150 PGs for OSD. Sometimes I go up to 200, knowing that the system will expand within uh, a reasonable time frame. But for this customer, he had a, a, a fixed set of OSDs running, and they were designed to run with 8,000 PGs. And he wanted to test something in addition to what we were uh, running as an application. So he simply uh, copied the, the number I had for the existing pools and created 10 additional or 8 additional pools with the same PG number. And so those, PG, those OSDs became overloaded. They had like 700 PGs uh, per OSD or something. It's never. Uh, so, uh, same topic, did you get rid of these PGs? Is, is it possible to, to decrease the number? It's very simple to increase, but not to decrease. So, they're the also asking, so the, the PG splitting uh, feature is increasing, PG merging is something which um, is on the, on, the, on the horizon. It's Sage that he was working on it, so um, uh, I'm not sure yet. Um, but eventually what we did was those testing pools uh, they didn't contain any data, so my main concern was getting the system up and running again. So added additional CPUs, added memory to get the system up and running. We set the no down flag, we set the no up flag. I, I was tuning heartbeat uh, values uh, everywhere to make sure it just calmed down. Um, and then eventually when it got into a clean state again, I removed those additional pools, the OSD stripped the PGs away. Uh, so luckily it was not even increasing the PG number for the existing pools but creating um, a new pools with uh, the same PG values. Just out of curiosity on the same topic, how often do you find that in just building the PG tools? PG okay, values? so how, how often do I find that in filling with the PGs? What I find is that it's pretty difficult for people to understand that PG is, although you set up a pool, it has an influence cluster Why? So they think that they should use the same value for every pool. Um, so it's still a pretty difficult topic for applicants to actually understand that they have a total number of PGs for a system and they need to divide it over the pools. So two things <clears throat> about the limit of the number of PGs per cluster. Yet, I mean, practically, you need up to 100,000. For the biggest clusters that you can imagine, you need 100,000 PGs. And things sort of work there. We tried it with 130,000, it was more or less okay. Um, now, what feedback? I think this was awesome. So, maybe like compile all of these and put them into stuff.com docs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, well, that's, that's good to hear. That's yeah. good to hear. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thanks for the feedback.